hey guys, in this video we're going to be looking at specific heat capacity. Now there's quite a lot going on in this practical, there's lots and lots of different questions the examiners can ask you, there's lots and lots of different ways maths can fit into this. So to help you really, really prepare for this, I've written you a load and load of questions. You can get the combined science questions or you can get the separate science questions. Back in the lab again. Here is our setup for specific heat capacity. We have our blocks. We have our thermometer. We've got aluminium set up at the moment. And we have iron and copper. We can take our start reading on the block. And in the hole in here, we need some water. We can see this is connected up to a power unit. So we're gonna have the power going in through here. And we have this connected up to a multimeter, but you might have it come through to a voltmeter, a meter, even a joule meter. Here we have a diagram of the practical. We have our block, our thermometer, and you need a tiny bit of water in here just to get rid of this air gap so that the energy in here can be transferred easily and read by the thermometer. This is our heating element and it's going to be connected up to power. What it's actually connected up to will vary depending on what uh, equipment your school has access to. It can be connected up to a joule meter where you can read the joules directly or like I've used, it can be connected up to a voltmeter and an ammeter where you have to do a tiny bit of maths. So here is my complete circuit. You saw in the video I was using 12 volts for my power input. The actual reading on the, the multimeter um, was 9.8 volts and then the ammeter reading was 2.8. I've drawn the circuit here kind of like correctly, not including a multimeter. So we have our ammeter in series and our voltmeter in parallel across the component that we're measuring the potential difference across. It is highly unlikely that your measured voltage across the component will be the same as what your power pack is set to. There are a lot of equations in this. We have energy which is measured in joules, equal to mass, measured in kilograms, times specific heat capacity. Units for this one are slightly tricky. They are joules per kilogram degree C. And then temperature change. This is temperature, and this means change. So this is temperature change. Temperature change is measured in degrees C. Now, if you have a joule meter, you can measure energy directly, but we don't. So we're going to be using energy in joules is equal to power in watts times time in seconds. To find the power, which is measured in watts, we are going to use our readings from the ammeter for current and our readings for potential difference from the voltmeter. I know there are lots of equations on this page and maybe this looks a bit more complicated than it did in school, but I'm going to break this down for you. We saw from our experiment that we had a current of 2.8 amps and we had a potential difference of 9.8 volts, giving us power into the system of 27.44 watts. Now we've used uh, this equation here to work out the power, we can use this equation over here to work out the energy. So that is simply the time, which is down this one, times the uh, power, which is this value here. So 60 times 27.44, 120 times 27.44, uh, 180 times 27.44, 240 times 27.44. And we're going to be using these values to plot a graph. Now, 
we know uh, from our experiment what the starting temperature was we can just read that off and then what we're going to be adding in this column down here is the temperature and we're going to be taking that temperature reading every minute this is for the aluminium block you might have collated your results as a class or you might have done all of the blocks. Now we've finished the experiment, we are going to plot a graph. And on the x-axis, we are going to be plotting the energy or the work done. They're the same value. And I'm going to plot this in kilojoules. And so it's simply just the first value. And then up the y-axis, we're going to be plotting temperature. Oh, changing that in there. Now you may have just plotted time along this axis that's absolutely fine it just means you have to do a bit more math later on making a fatal mistake of not putting things in the right place once you've got your points in you can draw your line of best fit and then we can find our gradients now finding your gradient is always going to be done by taking the up value and dividing it by the across value draw the biggest triangle that you can however it is kind of helpful if you draw the triangle so it lines up with known values it just makes things a bit easier for you construction lines are always a really good idea so the examiner can see clearly that you know what is going on and then showing all of your working. So you're showing the difference, 37.5 minus 25. Clearly showing the examiner what they are looking for, showing them that you know what you are doing. Right, that page was getting a bit busy, so just moving on to a clean page. So we can get our actual value for a gradient as 0.00129. Now the specific heat capacity can be found by 1 divided by the gradient. So specific heat capacity from my experiment came out as 773 joules per kilogram degree C. Now, we haven't used this equation over here, so that's what we're going to do now. Rearrange the equation to find specific heat capacity. And then I just like to write all the values down so I know what we're looking for. Mass is 1 because it's a 1 kilogram block. Energy, that is the time uh, energy at 10 minutes. And then the temperature change at 10 minutes. Popping those numbers into the equation. And by calculations, we get a value of 784 joules per kilogram degree C. Different, but actually pretty close to my experimental value. Now the actual value for this is 900 joules per kilogram degree C. You would never expect to get the actual value in an experiment, but you need to think about why it is different. For example, could adding insulation around the block so that all the energy from the heating element was transferred to the block and then to the thermometer and not so that the block ended up heating the outside air? How much of a difference would that have made? For every single practical, you need to know the independent variables 
the dependent variables. So here we were measuring a temperature change. You could change the block that you were using. The control variables, what did we keep the same, and a risk assessment. This one involved heavy blocks and electricity. The sources of error and how to prevent them, for example, uh, energy loss to the surrounding air, we could insulate it. Any alternatives, for example, we were using a thermometer, whereas a data logger would be more accurate. Lots of equations in there that need rearranging and some tricky units you need to remember. A large number of calculations, which I'm afraid you just need to practice for this, especially finding the gradient. A step-by-step -step method, which I've gone through. Any graphs that come up. You may find a graph that has a bit of a lag period at the end. That's just while the heating element warms up. And you need to be label, be able to label any diagrams of equipment. And if you've done, if you've used a dual meter in class, do not be surprised or do not be thrown if a voltmeter and an air meter come up in class or vice versa.